Okay. All right, so our speaker today is uh, Ms. Jenna Taylor, and she joined the Florida Trail Association at the beginning of 2020 as the Central and South Trail Program Manager. She has dedicated her career to supporting volunteer work and has spent the last seven years as an AmeriCorps Program Director in Education Sector. She holds a Master's in Social Work and Nonprofit Management and currently resides in Fort Pierce, Florida. When she is not working or hiking on the Florida Trail, Jenna coaches for Girls on the Run and for the Special Olympics Squarian team. So without further ado, I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Jenna. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate it. Let me get uh, this up here. All right. Uh, thank you. Jenna, you muted yourself real quick. Oh, sorry. There we go. So sorry. Um, my name is Jenna. I've been with the Florida Trail Association actually for one year tomorrow, um, which I'm really excited about. Um, it was a very interesting start to this job. Um, but what's really exciting to me is um, when I started in this role, um, I assume I was like a lot of you. I could tell you about the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail. I was a hiker. I um, spent a lot of time in Florida outside, but I had never heard of the Florida Trail. I had probably hiked on it many times, but um, had no idea um, that this was a resource here in our state. And um, so I'm hoping to, to get to change that for you guys. And um, to, to introduce you to the trail and, and the work that I love doing. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about what a National Scenic Trail is, um, a little bit specifically about the Florida National Scenic Trail, what we do with the Florida Trail Association, and um, how you can get involved, um, which is what I'm, I'm hoping all of you will want to do. I'm going to share just a video with you a little bit about the trail, and um, then we'll get started. Oh, sorry, I'm seeing that folks are saying they're having some trouble hearing the video. Um, so I don't know if it's possible, Kate or Nicole, that I share this out afterwards then. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. We'll um, we'll send the video in uh, with the follow up email, and we can also post it on Facebook. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Not a problem. I really like the the images. Look fantastic, though. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, we are part of the National Scenic Trail family, and um, the National Scenic. Uh, Trail Act created us in 1968. Um, there are 30 national scenic trails um, and they're split kind of into two groups. So there are national scenic trails, which is what we are. And those are trails that are 
um, really designated for recreational purposes. So they highlight um, historical and culturally significant um, things along the trail. Um, but then there's also national historic trails. And those typically follow um, historic routes. So thinking about things like the Pony Express Trail, um, the Lewis and Clark Trail. Um, so all in all, with the connecting and side trails uh, within the National Scenic Trails, there's about 50,000 miles of hiking trails that belong to the National Scenic Trail family. And um, we are actually the fifth longest. We're, we're right around 1,500 miles. Um, and we were the fifth designated um, as a National Scenic Trail. Um, so we extend from uh, Big Cypress National Preserve down in the Everglades all the way up through to Gulf Islands National Seashore um, in the Panhandle. Uh, if you can see that map, you'll see we have a few sections of the trail where. Um, hikers can, can take a, a left or a right. So one of those is around the lake, Lake Okeechobee. You can go east or west. And then just north of actually your area, you can go east or west again um, through the center of the state. Um, for our through hikers, so someone who starts all the way down at the bottom and hikes north, most of our through hikers go northbound. Um, they're, they're looking at about an 1100 mile hike. Um, all in all, but we do maintain 1,500 miles of what we call designated trail, which means it is part of the National Scenic Trail. Um, we are a winter trail, so obviously um, when a lot of the other National Scenic Trails are <laughs> not accessible because of uh, that white stuff, um, we are accessible. So most of our through hikers actually started this month, um, and, and the Typically, they hike northbound, kind of working with the weather. Um, any other time of the year here, it's either too hot or too wet. So um, most of our hikers do choose to start in January, um, finishing up in, in the late spring. And like I mentioned, we're really looking to highlight what makes Florida unique. Um, so while you are hiking anywhere on the Florida Trail, you will see quite the variety of um, landscapes and um, you will see quite a few historic sites. So we have done our, we're working actually right now on a new um, GIS layer that will let you see some more of the historic uh, things that you're passing as you hike on the, on the Florida Trail. Um, so things like uh, where turpentine was um, being created uh, early in Florida. Uh, you pass through, of course, several of our um, Native American tribal lands. Uh, right now, we, we have some trail through the Seminole Reservation um, down in Big Cypress. You'll pass old homesteads. You go through a ghost town if you hike in the uh, Kisso area. Um, so there's just some really neat things to see, um, and, and we try to highlight those. Um, so before we got on, uh, I heard that there was a question about where the trail was closest to Brevard County. Um, so I went and just did a quick screen grab of uh, what where the trail was near you guys. Um, where you see the yellow or orange line, that's the that's the trail route. And um, those little black dots, those actually indicate roadwalk. Um, so we are in the middle of a reroute in the Central Florida area. So um, if you look kind of in the center of the screen, uh, you'll see some non-connected orange lines. That's where the trail will go when the reroute is complete. And it's going to help remove some of that really long road walk that you see from Triple N up to um, Tosahatchee. So we're really excited about that. Um, our hope is to, to be able to get some more work done on that this um, this year in 2021 um, and, and to be able to get that on the ground and, and rolling. Uh, so you guys are really close to some, well, I think they're some of the best sections because they're my sections, um, but you guys are really close to a lot of our sections that are um, WMAs, like Triple N, Three Lakes. Um, I recently just hiked from Tosahatchee up to Little Big Econ State Forest, it's about 40 miles, and it is just gorgeous. Um, so you guys are, are close to a lot of really great sections. 
Um, our blaze on the trail is orange. So uh, again, every national scenic trail picks a, has a color. Ours is orange. Um, so anywhere that you're hiking on national scenic trail, you'll see our orange blaze. Um, anytime you see a white or a blue blaze, those indicate some of our loop trails or our side connecting trails, um, which we use to get from trailheads um, or to additional resources like camping and water. Um, where you see the two blazes, that indicates a turn. And so a blaze up on the right, um, the top on the right would indicate a right turn and um, obviously the same for our left. These are some views um, along the trail. Um, down in the bottom right corner there, that's along the Sewanee. That's probably one of our most popular uh, sections for folks to hike. Um, there actually is whitewater rafting in, um, it's just gorgeous. Um, of course, I'm again a little partial. Some of these are, are from my area. You've got, um, of course, Big Cypress and um, some of our state forests in the central part of the state. Uh, so I work with the Florida Trail Association. We are a nonprofit who are here to uh, promote, protect, and maintain this beautiful trail. Um, so we have three remote staff members like myself. So I cover the central and southern sections of the trail. Um, there's a oops, there's a, a northern part of Florida uh, regional representative as well as the Panhandle. And what we do is we coordinate with our land managers and our volunteers um, to make sure that the trail stays open and stays um, accessible for folks to come out and hike on. We also do a lot of education, environmental education, and um, just general outreach so that folks know that the trail is available. Um, we have a Gainesville office. We actually just uh, about three months ago moved into a new office. Um, we have five staff members who are based there, um, and they, they are really the ones supporting the membership and the chapters, um, as well as um, our fundraising and outreach. Um, we were founded, of course, to support the Florida Trail, and our first blaze was painted in 1966 in Ocala National Forest, but we weren't designated a trail until 1983. Um, over time uh, that the trail has been expanded and um, as a federally designated trail, um, we are, we do, re we did require congressional approval uh, to become enacted and there are still things um, to this day that would require that congressional um, assistance for us to make any, you know, big changes. Um, but we are really involved with our uh, land managers. So I think a lot of times uh, people want to know um, you know, how much land does the FTA has? We, we don't actually own any land. Um, all of the land that we use for the Florida Trail is land that we are gracious enough to be able to be on because of our land managers. Um, so the U.S. Forest Service, they actually are the uh, lead agency for the Florida National Scenic Trail. So um, then they allow us to work with the land managers. So our largest land manager uh, would be our water management districts. Uh, we work with all five water management districts in the state of Florida. We cross over 22 of their properties. Um, outside of them, we also work with FWC, state parks, state forests, National Park Service, um, and a few private landowners. Um, so how do they support us? Um, these, are, <laughs> these are two photos from this trail season. Um, these are two of our FWC employees um, on the left. We, we, we were really grateful um, because the trail is so wet this year. Uh, we, they brought out this side-by-side uh, -side to help us get volunteers and equipment uh, to some of the more remote and soggy places. Um, it sat there all weekend waiting for us to use it and finally uh, we got a chance to use it and drive it. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and then on the right, that's another one of our FWC partners who um, was helping us remove some invasives uh, from a campsite. And so we were removing Caesar weed. And if you're not familiar with Caesar weed, um, it's that plant that's very sticky um, and will just really wreck a hiker's day. Um, and so he was helping us um, winch out some of the larger roots um, from a campsite there. Uh, we, we could not do this work 
without our land managers. Um, they are just incredibly supportive of having the trail um, on their land. And, um, you know, and I think that's in thanks to our, our volunteers um, who, who show up every day and, and work to keep those trails nice for them. Uh, so now my favorite part about this organization and this job um, is that our trail is entirely maintained by volunteers. Um, I think there's a lot of people who think uh, we have professional trail crews who come in and we pay them to maintain the trail or um, <laughs> that I'm out there doing it, but no, um, we are entirely maintained by volunteers. Um, I, when I started in this job, I, I said to my supervisor, I said, I'm very overwhelmed um, by the passion that our volunteers have. They are, they're not just out there when I'm out there, they're out there all the time. Every day, I think you could find um, somebody out there doing trail maintenance. Um, and it is challenging, challenging work. Um, I know you guys are all familiar with, with Florida. And so you know that we have some unique challenges with the heat and the water. Um, because of the Kissimmee River restoration, we're really seeing um, an entirely different trail this year. Um, things are very wet. Things that weren't wet before are now wet. Um, and, and so when we get out there with these mowers, that mud really creates um, some difficulty. Um, so we rely on folks like all of these wonderful uh, individuals. So just quickly um, on the left there, that's top left, that's one of our Sawyers. So we do train and support um, a team of chainsaw volunteers. So they go through several um, levels of training to be allowed to operate a chainsaw. Um, so they, you know, with Florida with prescribed burning and hurricanes, um, we, we have drop down trees all the time and um, you, can't, you can't go around them. Uh, sometimes you, they have to be removed. Um, so we get volunteers that will hike out, you know, miles carrying their chainsaw um, to remove these, these down trees. Um, next, we have a lot of invasives on the Florida Trail and um, those invasives can close that trail up in a matter of months. Um, so that's one of our volunteers pulling Caesar weed by hand. Um, we found some Caesar weed in the campsite and we knew if we didn't get it now, um, it would take over that campsite. And so she was pull, pulling that by hand. Um, the top right is one of our safety briefings. Uh, we do a safety briefing every day for every work party. Um, goes over the plan of the day and um, you know how to be safe. Uh, we have a lot of new volunteers and so we go over it every day. New and seasoned volunteers get the same speech. Um, we do require everyone wears protective gear. So you'll see everyone wearing a hard helmet, um, gloves, eye protection, and if you're using anything mechanized, uh, we require ear protection as well. And so this is one of the more uh, less glamorous jobs, but that's one of our volunteers. We're, we're lucky enough to have a campsite with a shower, um, which we, we don't have a lot of structures along the Florida Trail, a lot of shelters, um, but this one, this one's very fancy. It has running water, bathroom, shower, lights, um, and this, this is about 275 miles or so into the trail, uh, so if you're a through hiker and you come upon this shower, you are you were living your best life. Um, so this was one of our volunteers this, this season who was getting that bathroom ready for us to use. That's at um, the Allen Broussard Conservancy, which is a private um, conservation land that lets us host the trail on there. And probably most important task of uh, trail maintenance is our, um, our trailblazer. Um, so there, Oops, sorry. Um, so because of the Florida heat, so we use a high acrylic um, paint and that you would think would last, but in that Florida sun, that blaze could be cooked off in just a season. Um, and those blazes are so important for navigation for through hikers. Um, cell phones don't always work, paper maps could get wet, um, but those blazes are really how our, our hikers use to navigate. And so every season, almost every blaze gets completely scraped off and repainted. Um, and especially because of prescribed burns, we'll, we'll come through and find a section that had been burned and all those blazes are gone. Um, last photo there, 
Uh, we do have a few sections of the trail where we are not allowed to use anything mechanized. Um, so no mowers, no chainsaws, no brush cutters. Um, so Hattie there is using what we call a Suwannee sling. Um, it's, it, it, you swing it back and forth and kind of cut down that, that grass, um, which starts out being really fun. And then after about five minutes is really exhausting. Um, so those are some really challenging sections to maintain, um, but we're, we're glad for people like Hattie. Hey, Jenna, we have a quick question. Sure. Um, it kind of, and it deals with uh, kind of trail maintenance. Um, sure. The question is, uh, uh, you mentioned the Kissimmee River situation as being a factor of how wet the trail is this year. Could you please expand upon it? Sure, um, I can as best I understand it so far. Um, so with, uh, with them, you know, restoring the river to its original route, so backfilling, um, you know, that channelization that we saw um, in the sections where the Kissimmee River is, um, it is holding a lot more water. So um, just as an example, um, just two years ago, we put in uh, quite a bit of, of punch in or, or bridges over some of those really wet sections. So I mentioned um, you know, that we use mowers. Um, so in some of those sections that have been wet, we put in these punch ins so that they can drive the mowers and, and they don't bog down. Um, I was there a couple weeks ago. There was a section where we're walking and um, it was about knee high and I kicked something and I thought, well, what was that? And I kept kicking it and kept kicking it and realized I was standing on one of our bridges. Um, so that's how much water uh, it, that region is now holding. Um, we also partner with FAU um, and they have a field lab right along the river um, in Lorita, Florida. And that field lab, um, they were sharing with us that this year the river came almost up to their building. Um, it's never done that in the past. Uh, so I think just it's just a matter of the, the river kind of re restoring itself to its original flow. Um, so we're, we're kind of going to wait this season and maybe one more um, to see how the water settles um, before we build some more infrastructure because um, there are some sections right now that are almost not passable or not maintainable because of the water level. That answer your question? Let awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, if we weren't out there every year, the Florida environment would take that trail back. Right? We have to do this every year, every year, every mile. Um, and in some sections, that's easier than others. Um, some sections we can come out in the weekend and knock out 15, 20 miles. Um, we did Big Cypress a few weeks ago, and in an entire weekend, we did three miles. Um, so it really just depends on, on where we're at. Um, typically, our structure is the mowers go first. So you see an example of one of our mowers here. Um, mowers go first. Then if it's necessary, somebody with a brush cutter, which is basically a, a souped up weed eater, uh, goes next. And then our team who carries the loggers or hand saws go. And what we're really looking to clear is a, this is five by eight, but what's easiest for me is kind of an arm spread wide and an arm spread high. So if it's gonna touch me, if I put my arms out in either direction or above my head, um, then we wanna clear that away. We also are clearing it for about a year's growth. Um, so we, we start our trail maintenance season um, in about September and um, while there are some sections that get continuously maintained, um, we try to maintain each section so it'll last about a year. Um, but, but things grow really fast in Florida. Um, so we try to trim back a little bit um, because you know we've come upon sections that they were maintained last year, uh, but they've completely closed in um, in, this, uh, in the summer months. I just added this in here because I, I was sure, I know it's on everybody's mind, even though we're all tired of talking about it. Um, so we did have a unique trail maintenance season this year. We actually did um, close the trail for maintenance um, from about April through August. So we did not allow any volunteers out to work on the trail. Um, and some of that was because a lot of the trail wasn't open. Um, most of our land managers made the decision to close the trail for recreation. Currently, the trail is all reopened with two exceptions. Um, campsites in the state forests are still closed 
and the trail through the Seminole Reservation is still closed. Um, they lost some tribal members and they just decided it was safest for them and, and we are respectful of that. Um, so currently, if you're through hiking on the trail, you have to get shuttled from I-75 um, up around the reservation. Uh, we are requiring masks in camp, um, for the most part in camp kitchen, anytime we're serving meals, um, and then anytime social distancing isn't possible. Um, so here's, here's one of our crews that built a bench. Uh, we hosted a women's uh, work party a couple weeks ago. And um, so they built a bench, uh, including one of our younger volunteers. So we uh, we do allow children to come out and volunteer with us as long as they have an adult with them. Um, and uh, so she was very proud of this bench. She got to sign it. It was very exciting. Uh, we've also put in touchless hand washing stations. Our chapters have been building those or using ours um, so that we have you know, multiple opportunities to wash hands. We're cleaning gear between use. We're cleaning tools between use. Um, our crew sizes and our group sizes are smaller, um, but we are really grateful because everyone's been really great about following protocol and we have been able to um, get our trail season back and, and keep working this year. Uh, so these are some of the other tools that I mentioned. That's a handsaw on the left and a lopper in the middle. Um, so we are trimming things flush to the tree. We, I, I feel sometimes people want to just come to the and start from the tail, but then you've just created a spear. Um, so we, we trim things all the way back to the trunk. Um, these are probably the most common tools. Everyone can use these. Um, so we have a lot of volunteers that come out and if you're new, um, we want you to try whatever you want. Um, but this is typically where folks start. And then these are some of our mechanized sill tools. So you'll see our mowers are not your typical front yard mower. They're pretty heavy duty. Um, they're self-propelled though. So um, on a good day, you're just kind of guiding them. On a bad day, you're slugging them through mud. Um, on the middle left, that's what a, a brush cutter looks like. So you wear it on a harness and you kind of swing it. That's probably my favorite thing to use. Um, it feels very powerful, I love it. Um, and then on the edges are our hedgers. Um, and those can, can get some work done really quickly. You'll see on the left there that, that uh, volunteer is actually standing in a field of Caesar weed. Um, so we typically, if we have the time, we'll try and do some pulling of the Caesar weed. That is the only way to remove it. Um, if it's hedged like that, it will grow back stronger. Um, so we did actually bring a, a volunteer group out that just uh, pulled Caesar weed um, in a really dense section, um, which is slow but tedious, but very beneficial work. Uh, we also do a lot of training for our volunteers. So we're doing um, on-site training at every work party. Um, we offer wilderness first aid um, regionally. So we've been offering that throughout the year. Um, we also, in non-COVID times, host a, a large trail skills event uh, where we're doing things like trail, uh, excuse me, uh, tool maintenance, how to sharpen blades, how to uh, fix small engines, uh, things like that. Obviously, we didn't host that this year, but um, hopefully we'll be bringing that back in the in the future. Um, and then the really the best part um, is how people get involved with, uh, with this work. So the local Do you mind chapter- doing that real quick, Jenna? You cut out for a second. Oh, sure. Um, just this, this part? Yes, please. Oh, okay. So this, uh, I just was saying the best part is how, how do you get involved? Um, we have 19 chapters and they're broken up regionally. So you guys actually belong to the Indian River chapter um, in, the, in the Brevard area. And our chapters are incredibly unique. Um, so the chapters have designated sections of the trail that they oversee. That's their primary task. So they know what trail they have to make sure it gets done. They have folks who are section leaders of that trail um, and they work to maintain that. But that's only a small part of what they do. Um, our chapters do a lot of recreational activities. So again, slowed down a little bit last year, but it's starting to pick back up. Um, so these, this looks like uh, recreational hikes, 
Uh, we have some groups that paddle. Um, we have some groups, so the Miami chapter, um, they are a very urban chapter, obviously. Um, so they're doing urban hikes, they do bike rides. Um, we had a chapter that's organizing a trip to Dry Tortugas. Um, it's just, I, they, there's so much that they're involved with. Um, our chapters are all listed on our website. And then each of our chapters maintain their own meetup uh, website, which is where they list everything that's going on. Um, but I would encourage you, you know, check out your local chapter first, but then also, you know, definitely look around the state and see what other folks are doing. Um, you guys are pretty central, so you could get to some of the other activities um, very easily. Um, and, and every chapter is very different. I love it. Um, and of course, we, we want you to become a member of the FDA. Uh, that helps you stay involved in all the things that we're doing statewide, gets you our magazine, which I think is wonderful because I write for it. Um, and, and quite a few other opportunities um, helps you to be the first to hear about our volunteer opportunities. Um, we post our state run volunteer opportunities on our website, but the local chapters are also hosting those ongoing maintenance events. And so, um, you know, I, I believe that everyone can do trail maintenance. Um, we, I would, you know, a lot of our volunteers are, um, have never done anything like this before, or they're retired and they're not sure if they can do it. Um, everyone can do it. Um, it is, it's, uh, it's fun work. It's instantly gratifying. I think that's the thing I hear over and over. It's instantly gratifying. Um, but there are other ways if you don't want to get out there and, and, and sweat. Um, there's other ways that we can use your support. Um, trail inspection, we, it's 1500 miles. Uh, we can't possibly know every time a tree falls down um, unless somebody's out there hiking it and telling us about it. Um, we one of my, you know, the greatest needs that I have as someone who hosts these events is we need help in the camp kitchen. Um, so maybe you don't want to work on the trail, but if you think you don't mind cooking for, for 15 people, um, I'd love your help in the kitchen. Uh, we need folks who just want to sharpen tools, you know, you can come to some of our, our uh, sheds and help us sharpen tools. We need folks who want to just do recreation activities. Um, we need folks who want to share about the trail um, to their to their groups. Um, so if, if you're interested in, in getting involved with the trail, we will um, definitely find a job for you. Um, there's lots and lots of things to do. Does anybody have any questions for me? Awesome. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Jenna. Uh, I loved I loved all the information you shared. And um, I felt like that was a really great, you know, summary of FTA, uh, Florida Trails Association. And I definitely learned some things. I didn't realize it was so big in Florida. <laughs> all right. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one are is, are dogs usually allowed? On the so yeah, so I'm, I'm a, I have two dogs and you might have heard them barking at my garbage man. Um, so yeah, so uh, for the most part, it's, I would say yes, but it is again, land manager dependent. Um, we don't make that decision. It's up to the specific land manager. And um, so wherever you decide you're going to go, I would say just take a quick peek um, on our website. Uh, all of our land managers are listed. So you could say, okay, I'm going to Triple N. Um, there's resources there. I will definitely remind everyone too that a lot of our lands host hunting. Um, so, you know, please be sure to always check for hunt dates um, before you hike. Um, if you're hiking with a pet, some kind of, you know, orange on you and your pet. Um, even if it's not hunting season, I, I would highly encourage you to like that, that vest I'm wearing in that photo is very beautiful. Um, wear something like that. Awesome. All right. So um, does the FTA work with Brevard County EELS program or EELS program? I don't know what that is, mm -hmm. um, but I, I shared uh, before this presentation. So um, my knowledge of the work that the chapters do is really um, primarily about the Florida National Scenic Trail. However, our um, local chapters are very involved locally. Um, so there's a possibility that they, there may be some overlap there that I'm just not aware 
aware of. Um, but you know, our chapters are, they're sought after volunteers. Uh, so if there's opportunity to do outreach or maintenance um, with that organization, I would say probably. And actually that kind of ties in a little bit to our next question. Um, is there a minimum monthly requirement if you are a volunteer for number, uh, for volunteer hours? Nope. Um, you know, we have some volunteers we see once a year. We have some volunteers we see once a, a month, once a day. Um, so no, uh, no, no minimum requirement. Awesome. All right. So um, what's your favorite section of the FT? Uh, and uh, I quote, uh, the best bang for your proverbial buck. <laughs> um, you know, I had a feeling this was going to be a question we had. So I will say, number one, if you are Floridian and you have never hiked in Big Cypress, um, you need to start there. Uh, it is just, it, you can't explain it. You can't get a, a sense of it um, from photos. Um, it is definitely worth the trip. Um, it's definitely worth staying overnight, hiking a little bit in that area. Um, but that being said, I, I will say the section, um, Probably Prairie Lakes is probably, I think, one of my favorite sections. Um, bang for your buck. It has a, two loop trails. So you can um, actually either do a loop, you could hike straight through, or you could do a figure eight. Um, so I think for a lot of people who are getting out and exploring the trails um, for the first time, that's a really great one. And it's just like bananas, beautiful, um, large oak canopies. It's very dry. Um, you're not going to get wet. Um, <laughs> too wet. Um, I would say that's probably one of my favorite sections. Little Big Econ State Forest, close to you guys too. Also just really beautiful. Um, you're hiking along the, the river there. There's some really large um, bridge and, and punch in infrastructures in there where you've got just gorgeous views. Um, I'd say that's mine. Those are my you favorite. You said that was Prairie Lakes? Prairie Lakes, yes. Prairie, sorry, I'm writing these down as well. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see, we have another one here. Um, are there any publications that suggest ways to hike, but also find nearby accommodations? I'm older and would like to leisurely and not roughing it experience. <laughs> yes, um, so so a couple of, of things to check out. So on our maps, um, and you'll see where the trails towns are kind of listed. So on our maps, it shows you, you know, kind of close, close towns there. Um, I'd also recommend the website Florida Hikes. Um, so that's a privately run website, but she has done an excellent job providing guides for all kinds of, um, you know, all kinds of guides for, for day hikes, for um, hikes with dogs, hikes with your bike, um, you know, things like that. Um, I, there's also a couple of apps out there. The Florida Trail has an app um, that would kind of let you see some perspective. Um, there's an app called Gut Hook. Um, that is a paid app, but also um, shows you great proximity to, to different resources as well. Very cool. Yeah, I, I don't blame people. I don't know how much I would want to <laughs> camp with all of the snakes, but you know. <laughs> um, so let's see. So we have one more here, and it says, uh, is there a central site where you can tra check trail conditions? So on our website, um, on the floridatrail.org website, we have a section that's called no, that says notice to hikers. Um, and that will have any pertinent um, updates about um, the trail. So for example, if there's any burn. So our land managers are wonderful for the most part for the most part. Uh, they notify us if there's a prescribed burn. They give us some heads up. So we'll post that on our website so you don't find yourself out with that. Um, Big Cypress, if you're interested in the water levels, um, they've asked that folks just call the visitor center at Oasis. Um, I have a current uh, notice right now because water levels are very high. Um, they had a hiker who uh, did have to be extracted um, a couple of weeks ago, just got out there and the water was just too high, got too tired, had to get extracted. Um, and so they did ask us to put, but they said, you know, please just encourage folks to call. Um, but that's where that information lives. Awesome. Definitely good to know. It's, I, I really enjoyed how you said, you know, in Florida, you, you have to contend a lot with, you know, the heat and the water, you know, even in times that you don't expect the trail to be wet, it could easily be a wet trail. And so, um, okay. So I had a question. Um, so when you are doing trail maintenance and you cut down trees or bushes, um, do you have to hike out 
the trails or uh, the pieces, especially if it's like an invasive plant? So um, when, I, when I first started this job, it was kind of taught to me like, we want to make this trail look like it magically appeared. Um, and so that being said, what we try to do is we try to throw the cuttings, you know, cut side down and kind of off, but um, no, we don't pull anything out. Um, if we're cutting those large logs, we're kind of just rolling them to the side. I mean, uh, we try to make it look like we didn't come through there and trample, but um, you know, there are some things that we have to leave. Um, of course, if we find anything that doesn't belong there, and I will tell you, and I'm sure you guys know this too, I find balloons every time we hike. Uh, when we were down working in Big Cypress, I pulled out four. Um, last time when I was hiking up in the state forest, I pulled out three. Um, they're everywhere. So anything like that, we're, we're pulling out um, at trash, things like that. Um, but for the most part, we just kind of tuck it in as neatly as we can along the side. That's awesome. Who would, who would have thought that, you know, balloons can, you know, so much joy can cause so much environmental damage. <laughs> It's pretty, it's almost a little jarring when you're in such a remote spot like, like Big Cypress um, and, and then to find, to find trash. You're just like, yeah. how did this get here? Um, yeah. yeah. I, I definitely agree. That can definitely be one of the biggest bummers, but um, let's see. So I had another question about the reroute that y'all are working on. Mm -hmm. um, I know that that got a little pause with COVID and everything, um, but now that you started it up again, how long do you think it will take for that reroute to be completed? So um, I think, you know, once once things get rolling, um, you know, the, the work that needs done uh, is not, is pretty minimal. And um, a lot of the trail has already been cut in. It's really just about making those final connections. Um, we have one large section that's kind of necessary. So um, that, that one's the one that's on hold. Um, and as soon as we get that piece going, I, I would say we could do it in about a season, um, but it's just a matter of red tape and, um, and getting that kind of on the ground. Um, there's, you know, future plans of, of you know, for hopefully a land bridge that would help with some of this, um, not only for the hikers, um, but also for migration patterns. Um, you know, there's a, there's some great documentaries out there about Florida and, and how narrow it's becoming and what that's doing to migration. Um, and, and so we're trying to make sure as we put this reroute on the ground, you know, how can we help mitigate some of that, um, you know, not just for us, but for, for some of the wildlife. That's awesome. And uh, so I did, uh, so, okay, so if anybody else has questions, please feel free to submit them. Otherwise I, I got some more. <laughs> um, for your, um, with COVID, um, there were probably some volunteer groups that weren't able to like get out there for like a long period of time. Um, are there some trails that are just like, well, these are lost for now. Uh, oh, this is, we're, we're gonna need to bring out like a, you know, big tractor or something. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if I can necessarily bring, blame COVID, but I can blame Florida hurricanes. Um, uh, so uh, this and, and a little bit of COVID. So as you might have been paying attention, a lot of those hurricanes that we had this year went straight into the panhandle. Um, so that that section has been recovering from Hurricane Michael still, um, because not only do we have the blowdowns that happen immediately, but we had all the trees that died and then each of these hurricanes that come through, blow them down again. Um, so, so those blowdowns in the panhandle are pretty significant. Um, also because of Hurricane Michael, what we went through up in that area was a, a real loss of volunteers. Um, a lot of our volunteers lost everything um, or this just couldn't be a priority in their life anymore, um, be, and, uh, understandably. Um, and so that section's really had a hard time um, getting back to normal. They, they, they are getting there. Um, I know I mentioned before, we don't use paid uh, staff, but we, we do have, um, in, in that region, we have worked with a organization called Framing Our Community. Um, and they've come in and done rebuilt some of our infrastructure that was damaged. Some of those large bridges where you, you can't wade through it, you've got to go right. over it. Um, so they've come in and, and done some of those projects for us. Wow, that's fantastic. And yeah, that is, that's something to definitely have to contend with, you know, Florida getting what, three to five hurricanes, I think every year. And so that would definitely, that's something that, you know, if you live on the coast, you don't always think about what happens inland as much. And so um, I'm glad that things are going okay now and that even though that there's still a lot of work, it seems like, you know, there are some great groups that you're working with up there. All right, so we got one question submitted. Uh, what are your considerations for dangerous wildlife and how are volunteers trained or hikers made aware? 
Um, so yes, there are lots of things to contend with in, in Florida. I, I get these very casual reports from some of my volunteers like, oh yeah, we were out hiking, found four rattlesnakes. Like, oh, that, that's good. Um, so, so yes, part of our safety briefing for all of our volunteers, it does include things like um, snakes, biting bugs and, and stinging plants. Um, so we recommend, as you can see, like I'm wearing um, long sleeves and long pants and high socks. That's our number one recommendation for keeping uh, plants off of your skin. Um, we, we do go over, you know, what where snakes like to hang out. So snakes like to hang out under warm, dry, dead uh, branches. So, you know, we always recommend everyone, you know, kind of gives that a rattle before they stick their hand under there and, and yeah. pull it up. Um, and, and that's all a big part of our wilderness first aid team uh, training. So wilderness first aid goes over all of that and what to carry. All of our crews carry first aid kits, our mowers um, and sawyers carry, you know, really hefty uh, first aid kits. Um, we're in the process of, of getting some additional, uh, you know, things like tourniquets and things like that for our Sawyer kits. Um, you know, and, and but honestly, I think the some of the hazards that get us the most are really tripping hazards, um, especially down in Big Cypress with the water. Those are huge limestone holes um, that can, you know, swallow a foot really fast. Um, so I would say we see a lot of trips and that comes down to just knowing um, how to be safe when carrying your tools. I see a lot of people want to carry their lappers like this or hunt kind of here, but then, you know, if you trip and fall, there's, that's, that's dangerous. So we, we just really try to coach everyone um, on, on how to do that. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, I saw a pygmy rattlesnake on the side of the Tojihatchee Trail once. It was blended in very well. Yes. All right. Um, so what happens when one needs to use the restroom on a trail service? <laughs> um, right. so, so this is a very common question. And so we, uh, we practice leave no trace. So we, we encourage everyone, you know, to practice those when it comes to that as well. So digging cat holes and um, either packing out, uh, packing out all toilet tissue and things like that. Um, we have, you know, we're lucky enough, we do have some of our campsites for our work activities where we have restrooms, but that's not most common. Um, you know, we try to always encourage everyone, let someone know you're going off the trail, leave your hard hat there so people know kind of where you went. Um, <laughs> but uh, it is, especially when we bring out some of our younger groups of, of volunteers and, and we kind of go through that process with them. It's it's very jarring. But, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Awesome. Um, uh, also, um, let's see, so how does uh, the FTA handle feral pigs that root, root up sections of the trail? So, yep, yeah, that's a huge, that's a huge problem in some of our sections. Um, there's not much we can do about that. Um, we, I have some section, some chapters who have heard, you know, haul out rakes and try to smooth them over. If it's really damage the section so badly that they can't get the mowers through. Um, I will say the only reason that I have enjoyed the hogs from time to time is, is they will make it much easier to pull up Caesar weed because they'll kind of lose <laughs> those roots for us. So, you know, sometimes we have to, to take what we can get. Um, I think that's where, you know, being in partnership with some of our lands that allow hunting um, can, can come into play um, because they definitely can create a large mess. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Um, and so what are, what is the age range for volunteers that work in your groups? Um, so we, we allow any age as long as they're under 18, as long as they have a parent with them. Um, but I would say our, our, our average demographic is, is probably, if I had to guess, I, I don't know this off the top of my head, um, but probably 55 and over um, is probably our, our most common volunteer. Um, they are, because they can get out there sometimes on the weekdays. Um, on the weekends, when we host our state-run volunteer activities, we do see a little bit of a younger demographic um, or some families. Uh, we had uh, the pleasure of having actually three families out at one of our work parties in the northern region this year, um, which was just really fun. It's fun to create those young trail stewards, um, teach them how to be safe doing trail maintenance now, um, 